Hey everybody, welcome to the Cripes Cast. I'm your host, Charlie Behrens. This is the podcast where we talk to people for and or from the Midwest. We are brought to you by Jolly Good Soda. Hello folks, welcome to a very special episode of the Cripes Cast. This is our second live episode ever. Uh, we uh, shot this episode at the Terrace at UW-Madison, the Wisconsin Union Terrace. It was super fun. It was a panel, actually, with Dan Egan, who is a return guest. He is, of course, the author of The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. He also has a new book out called The Devil's Element, Phosphorus and a World Out of Balance. And his book is all about phosphorus. Phosphorus is something that uh, we all create. It's in our waste. You do the math on that one. It's something that it's sort of the building, one of the building blocks of life. We could not have life without it. But when we mine it and we use it um, in, in certain ways, um, it winds up in our waterways and screws some things up. So um, anyway, that's sort of what this conversation is about. We also had two other experts join us from UW-Madison. We had Jake Vanderzanden. He is um, an expert of Freshwater Lakes and the director of UW-Madison Center for Limnology. And also Randy Jackson from the Department of, Agro of Agronomy at UW-Madison. And uh, he's kind of talking about sort of successful agricultural systems. I introduce them all in, in, in the longer version, so you can kind of get that vibe out there. But I just sort of wanted to say this up top. Uh, part of this conversation involves uh, farmers and it involves farming practices. And um, just off the top, I want to say that I've got so much respect for our farmers and the, the farmers are already implementing a lot of the, the things uh, that need to limit phosphorus in our waterways. Uh, fertilizing practices. They're already um, a, you know, it, I, I was talking to a few of my buddies who, who are farmers, um, you know, before this conversation specifically, and sort of where they're coming from on this is they're already dealing with a, a lot of regulations. Uh, they're not making a whole lot of money. So the idea of putting more regulations in is a very difficult thing and also you know they they know the land and they're no farmer is out there trying to waste any fertilizer which is where phosphorus um, comes from and, and how it gets into our waterways so all farmers out there are trying to do the right thing this really has nothing to do with um current farmers and how they're practicing rather it's sort of uh the system and how do we look at this system that frankly our polit our, our politics have set up and say, do we still want this? You know, is this kind of what we as a society still want? And that's us as people, farmers as farmers, do we want it? Is there a better system, more of a win-win system where farmers can be more profitable and where the environment can be uh, better? You know, and I think we uh, have a couple creative solutions that uh, we discuss in this, but it's really important to me at the top of this that we just reiterate that this is not a knock on farmers. Farmers are sort of acting within the system and the rules that are put in place by our public policy and by our politics. And honestly, that's where the problem lies. It's not with the farmers, it's with the politics and the system that the rest of us have put in place. And on top of that, all of us eat food, all of us create waste. So we are all contributing to um, phosphorus in our water systems. And it's not just farming. It's also uh, the fertilizer we put on our gardens, the fertilizer we put on golf courses, uh, waste treatment facilities, which could often do a better job of uh, treating that waste and um, industry. So there's several different sources of um, phosphorus. Agriculture happens to be a major source. So that's kind of the focus of this podcast, but um, I just off the top. I just want to make it clear that um, th that this is a, a group effort and we're all just trying to find a win-win for this situation. So um, with that, uh, I'm joined off the top here by Colleen Maraca, EP of the Cripes Cast. Colleen, you did a great job um, setting up and producing this live deal. And by the way, we packed the terrace somehow. Yeah, it, without beer. Without beer. They 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 weren't serving beer, I think, because what it was move in week. Yeah. And then they always pretend like, yeah, we don't drink here. Yeah. So, you know? I think it was like they didn't want to supply the kids or people were like, they don't want parents. They're like, 
it would be set up parents in an uncomfortable situation to see their kids drink. And I'm like, well, newsflash. <laughs> <laughs> They're going Ugh. to one of the top party schools in the nation. So, yeah. um yeah, well, I get it. It's, it's, a, ni- it's a nice thought. It's yeah, a nice thought. It's, a little, it's holding up the illusion for the last week before their kid leaves them. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, it was good, though. They, someone brought you hams, which was really sweet. That was nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was when I was like preparing stuff for this. Um, when they had Randy Jackson, I thought of like American Idol. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, wouldn't that be funny if like you have all these like scientists and then like Randy Jackson's there. He's like, it's no for me, dog. <laughs> so yeah, I was laughing. I'm at, sure like, Randy gets that all the time. Yeah. So uh, I thought that was funny, but they did a really good job and it was fun to be back on the terrace. Yep. Gotta UW love. Madison alum, Colleen yeah, Morocco. Back at you. Back at, yep, yep. Um, but yeah, it was really nice to be back and it was so pretty out and perfect day for the, it it worked out well. Awesome. So, um, it's officially September. Yeah. How does that like feel for you? Oh, geez. You're really going to bring that into the mix? Yeah. Uh, It's kind of like, where, where did the time go? We recorded this on August 31st. And so it's just kind (sighs) of like, it's September. I know. I know it's bizarre. Yeah. Um, and it's also a heat wave coming. I know. So thank goodness I'm getting out of the city and gonna be at my parents. Uh oh, you're you're going to because they're gonna, gonna have be, air conditioning. Oh, got it. Yeah. Got it. You know. Well, you've got an AC vent in your room. I do now, and I have those that I took from the basement. Yeah. Um, but it's just like then I don't have to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get but it. Yeah, I'm excited to have that. They have all my Coffee. my dad has all my coffee stuff ready he's already told me what creamers i've got waiting for me oh wow yeah i'm That's ex- really super nice. excited your parents must be excited to see you yeah my dad even texted me he's like i can't wait to see you and i was like wow, wow. <laughs> okay Jeez. <laughs> relax huh but anyway yeah it'll be nice and uh do you have any labor day plans uh doing a show on westby um and which um is gonna be fun we got two sold out shows there not to brag um where is it Westby, oh, it's over by Lacrosse, over by the uh, by the pinky base of the pinky finger, a little lower, a little lower, I think. Nice. Yeah, there. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna cool. be a good time. Uh, really kicking off the tour with this show, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, it it'll be good. And by the way, we've got um some shows that are not completely uh, sold yet. We got them up there yep. on Mandua or on Cripescast.com. Click on the tour section. Yep. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys. See you guys on the road if if you're interested. What's your favorite thing about being on the road? <sighs> I like seeing different parts of the state and i like uh finding i I like going to places and sort of observing people like i was um i was out working and i was actually in an airport and i was writing an airport sketch we did a string of airport sketches and i just sat down i was initially like i gotta get back i gotta get back i gotta write this sketch this airport sketch and i was like well why, why am i getting back to do it you know, why not just sit there and watch people? And um, I think I've, I've done that before in different cities, like just go to a bar and just observe people because mm. that's where this whole bit came from. And it is kind of a, a fun thing to do. And that sounds really creepy. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to go observe people, you know, mm-hmm. but it, at the airport, man, I found something very peaceful in watching uh, grown men in business attire race somewhere just running to catch their plane Mm -hmm. you know so many people are running in the airport an airport is one of the only places where it's a normal thing to just see a grown adult just booking it booking it yeah you know for some of those people that's the only running they have done in the past (laughs) year you know and um and it's it's something it's kind of like when you're uh one of those people and you work in a high-rise building and you're just looking at traffic you're just looking at a situation you don't want to be in and you can find some peace of not being in that particular situation yeah although now the next time i'm late for a plane i'm gonna catch the eyes of someone people just staring like at looking me looking at you and judging I'm you be like i hate you yeah anyway anyway folks uh we will now transfer transfer you over to our live podcast our second live crepes cast podcast uh here is my conversation all about phosphate it's phosphor did i just say phosphate it's phosphorus 
And you know what? I, I think I did that like during this thing. So folks, it's actually a good disclaimer on this whole deal. Whether I said, I'm sure I did it yesterday. Phosphate though, I'm looking it up now. Here's the difference. Phosphate is a noun that means an electrically charged particle. Phosphorus, also a noun that means a mineral found in phosphate. So I meant to say phosphorus anytime I said it. How does that sound? It's like a square versus a rectangle. Like a square can be, or like a rectangle can be a square, but a square can't be a rectangle. I don't know. Either way, you, know you what get I mean? what I'm like, saying. Listen to Dan in yeah, this thing. I'm not the, the scientist. Experts. He's yeah. not. Yeah. There's plenty of Dan, Randy, and Dan, Randy, and Jake. Those guys know what they're talking about. All right, folks. Well, without further ado, here's my conversation with Dan Egan, Jake Vanderzanden, and Randy Jackson on the Wisconsin Union Terrace. And we are talking about phosphorus. Folks, I want to welcome you all to this live uh, taping of the Cripes Cast podcast. Uh, the Cripes Cast is uh, my podcast. That's the tagline. So we got that going here today. And today we are talking about phosphorus and its impacts on our lakes here in Wisconsin, uh, what some of the culprits could be and what we can all do about it collectively. So I want to first introduce our panel. To my left is Dan Egan. Uh, he is an author, Pul Pulitzer Prize runner-up twice. Is that the deal, Dan? Loser twice. Uh, Pulitzer Prize losing author twice in a row. There you go. Uh, but he wrote The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. It's a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and his latest book, The Devil's Element, is all about phosphorus and a world out of balance. So I'll give uh, Dan one more round of applause. And then next to Dan, we got Randy Jackson. He's from the Department of Agronomy, okay, at UW-Madison. Uh, and and uh, he's going to be explaining about agricultural systems, how they can be successful, how some of them are currently not successful. And did I say agronomy right or no? You said agronomy right, but we just renamed ourselves Plant and Agroecosystem Sciences. It really rolls off the tongue. That's a sexy name. Yeah. Yeah, I, agronomy, I was going to tell you, I was like, that don't look good at a, on a shirt. But when you take the whole shirt up, describing it, now we're now we're cooking with gas. Half shirt is never is never here. Yeah. And uh, Randy, uh, you're, you're, you're wearing a, a shirt called uh, Grassland. What's that all about? Grassland 2.0. That's uh, the idea that one way or another, eventually, we have to have agricultural systems that more closely resemble and mimic the ecosystem functions of the original prairie. All right. Randy Jackson, folks. He's your grass man, okay? And no, I don't mean it like that. I see that uh, Grateful Dead shirt back there. Um, okay. And now, all the way over at the left, we've got Jake Vanderzanden. He's an expert. Yeah, let's hear it for me. He's an expert of Freshwater Lakes and the director of UW-Madison Center for Limnology. What in the hell is limnology? I hear that question all the time. Limnology is the study of inland waters. So lakes, but also rivers, wetlands, inland water systems. Inland water systems. Okay. Also would look good on a shirt. I like that. All right. So um, I want to start off this conversation uh, by talking uh, with Dan and have him sort of set the stage here. Dan, uh, your latest book, The Devil's Element, is all about phosphorus. Uh, for everybody out there who either doesn't know or doesn't care what phosphorus is, what is it and why should they care? Well, it's, it's the fertilizer that puts food on our table, and it's existed in the environment forever, but in the last 100, 120 years, we figured out how to turn a slow trickle of this essential nutrient into a gusher. And we do that by mining rocks in various caches around the world. And it's allowed the population on Earth to go from about a billion to some nine billion and, and heading for more. With, without phosphorus, we couldn't do it. The problem is, there are finite resources, finite supplies of these rocks, and we're also burning through it at such a pace that it's getting into the water. And when it gets into the water, it's not going to grow a kernel of coin, corn or a soybean. It's going to grow algae, and too often that's toxic algae. And that's why too often there are days here where the lake looks beautiful out in the middle, but there's a green goop along the shoreline, and it is not just unsightly and unpleasant, it's downright dangerous to be in. 
Well, and, and let's talk about now sort of like, why is it dangerous? Can the limnology department tell us about why is it so dangerous to be in that uh, goop? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the phosphorus, as, as we mentioned, comes in from the surrounding, surrounding lands. And as Dan mentioned, it fuels blooms of algae. Um, it also fuels blooms of something called cyanobacteria, and those produce toxins. And these toxins are harmful to people, wildlife, they can cause death. Um, a wide range of health conditions uh, derive from, from, from this. So uh, it's, it's really bad. It's also unhealthy for the lake. So the lake turns green, we lose biodiversity, the lakes become anoxic, there's no oxygen left, which basically makes them um, uninhabitable to life. So it has really bad impacts on lakes and on the people that are uh, surrounding and using the lakes. And so, like, if, if you were golfing, like, I used to be a caddy, and I would look at the uh, ponds in the middle of the golf course, because I'd be like, oh, I wonder if they got any bass in there, you know? And then the guy I was caddying for would be like, where's my iron? I'd be like, I'm anemic. I lose all your irons. And um, so funny, Charlie. Really good joke. That was hilarious. Way to slide that one in there. So, but when you're on a golf course, oftentimes you see these ponds that are just nothing but sludge, unless they have the money to just dye them blue. Is that not, what we're talking about? Do not swim in them. And I think that the why not? Why? Because they have toxic blue green algae in them, and you can get really sick. I, I wasn't there a case back in the early '90s where a kid went swimming in a golf course pond in Dane County? 2002, a kid was swimming in a golf course pond in Madison, and he died. And the autopsy indicated that blue green algae poisoning was the likely culprit. So people die of this. Very interesting. Uh, and by interesting, I mean uh, tragic. But also, there, there is a um, kind of a funny story that you start your book off with, uh, Dan. What, uh, tell people about that story real quick. Funny, funny for us, I guess, not for the guy that it happened to. But yeah, there was a, a guy down in uh, Cape Coral, Florida. He was being uh, chased by the police and he ditched his car. He had drugs in the car. And uh, went for it on foot and jumped into a canal. And he jumped into a canal that was just covered in this goop. And uh, he started to drown. I mean, he was, the, the cops would not go in to get him. They were trying to get him a lifeline. They were trying to call a ra or radio for a raft. And he ended up dog paddling his way back. And uh, they pulled him on, on to uh, a backyard. And this is all on body cam. On, you know, you can watch it. You can go to YouTube and watch this poor guy. It was a viral video, folks. Everyone was like, this dumb criminal got caught for drugs and then almost drowned himself. But um, he jumped into toxic goo. And, you know, it, it's, it's not just swimming. If you're close to this stuff, it aerosolizes. And there's some concerns that it's causing or could be a potentially one factor in the trigger for some neurological diseases like ALS. So that's... We'll stick away from that for right now, but um, you don't want toxic blue-green algae in your lake or in your neighborhood. You don't want it anywhere. And now that we've kind of defined uh, what the problem is and how phosphorus, you know, sort of perpetuates it, I want to turn over to Randy and um, ask him about uh, sort of the agricultural systems in play that are kind of promoting this. And by the way, I do want to say at the offset, uh, a ton of my family and friends are farmers and uh, farming is one source of phosphorus. We are all a source of phosphorus, you know, after you have a few too many beers and, you know, you, you got to go uh, drain the jerky, as my grandpa used to say. Um, good, Charlie. Really good. Way to bring your grandpa's best quote into this thing. Um, but we're all sources of it. And in, there are several industrial sources, but agriculture is another uh, very big source of that. So, Randy, could you kind of elaborate on those systems? Yeah, sure. So our agricultural system is set up to basically extract and squeeze as much as we can out of the land. And that is no fault of any farmer. The farmers are doing what, what the system is set up to do. And they're responding to the signals that society is sending them, which is like, make as much as you can, make as much as you can. And so there is this um, just incessant push to keep producing more and more and more. Um, and as a result, the system is inherently leaky. We squeeze a lot of nutrients out of it. It's not just phosphorus. It's uh, nitrogen. We lose carbon to the atmosphere and help drive climate change. And so the harder we push those ecosystems, the harder we push the agricultural system, the more leaky, leaky it's going to be of those nutrients. 
And so we have to, this whole notion of grassland 2.0 is we have to find a way as society to signal to farmers, can we expect a little bit less out of the land and reward you for that and take care of you, the farmer, for taking care of us? Yeah, yeah, you could clap for that. There you go. So right now, kind of my understanding of the uh, system we had set up. Sorry, Dan, you were about to, uh, you did the ice cream cone with your with your mic. Were you, did, did you have something to say there? Oh, you were itching your ear. Okay, false, false start on that. The system that we currently have in place, and you know, maybe this is just general knowledge of how I see it, is basically uh, we have our politicians, we have um, big conglomerate um, farming corporations, and they... Um, uh, they call it lobbying, but I think uh, most people just see it as bribing politicians into doing things. They're right. Was that cynical, Charlie? Come on, say no. no but, but you, you promised you weren't going to get me in trouble. I, I'm not getting you in trouble, but you do have these bigger corporations that w are, are invested in seeing something done one way, and they kind of push um, politicians on sort of the national and, and various local levels to do so. Is that accurate or is it more nuanced than that? It's definitely more nuanced. It's but, accurate you know. and more nuanced than that. Uh, it's accurate in that we desperately need policies that will help shape this kind of agriculture that I talked about a minute ago. And it's almost impossible to get those kind of policies enacted, especially at the federal level. There's heroic efforts at the state level and even at the local level and the county level, et cetera, to push us to get more of those types of policies in place. Um, but of course, whenever you're poking at the bear, the bear being the corporations that are actually making money from the current system, it, it's a hard thing to push and a hard thing to change. So I guess, how is the system set up right now where it's, uh, promoting, um, more, more phosphorus? What are the crops that are subsidized and should they, should they be in your opinion? Well, there are seven commodity crops that are subsidized by the federal government and here in this part of the world, corn and soybeans. Uh, wheat uh, are, are some of the uh, crops that, that get subsidies from the federal government. And the point of the subsidies is to keep those systems profitable, even when they're not really profitable. And so if we were to take some of those subsidies and put them towards something like grassland that actually holds on to phosphorus, that actually holds on to carbon, that actually helps promote biodiversity, uh, we'd be in a lot better position. Uh, but there are a lot of vested interests and powerful interests that don't want that to happen. And those are mainly corporations. And again, I'm not, these are the corporations reacting rationally. They're doing what they're supposed to do, which is maximize profits for their shareholders. So I, it, they're not nefarious actors. They're just responding to the system that we've set up. And we have to come together as a people and figure out how to change the system so that it's better for all of us. Um, Dan, in uh, doing your book, you've seen uh, sort of a similar thing at play back in the 70s with detergent and how that had a lot of phosphorus in it. And it was a really bad deal. And somehow we turned the tables on it. Can you kind of give us a, a quick uh, story about yeah, that? Sure. Yeah. And we turned the tables on it with science, which is, you know, it's got to drive everything. And the, one of the reasons when we were talking about doing this, we were talking about doing it on the terrace by Lake Mendota, which is having algae troubles for many years now. And we have some of the smartest people who can address these problems. Two of them are up here right now, right here on this campus. It's the Wisconsin idea. Take the stuff out of the classroom and put it into the environment and to, into communities and better people's lives. And that's exactly what happened in the 1970s. The lakes were going to heck. Uh, all across the country, none was in worse shape than Lake Erie, which they were calling America's Dead Sea at the time. And it was just, it was covered with literally hundreds of square miles of goop. Nobody knew what was going on. What was driving it? Was it, was it industrial pollutants? Was it nitrogen? Was it phosphorus? Was it carbon? So uh, some scientists went up to far northwestern Ontario and they this is remarkable. They, they set aside a cluster of lakes and started treating them like test tubes. They were given carte blanche to basically poison these lakes to see what would make them turn green. They, it was like uh, test tubes on a, on a lake scale. And through dumping various inputs into these lakes, 
they determined, well, the most dramatic uh, experiment they did was they took one lake, it's na named Lake two, 226. <laughs> and they Good name it. for the lake, Yeah, by they the had way. so many lakes, they couldn't even name them. They just gave them numbers. Anyway, they, they cut this one in half with the polyurethane curtain. And in simple terms, they gave one side phosphorus and one side nitrogen. Well, both, anyway, one side got phosphorus. That side turned green as a golf course in a matter of two weeks. Uh, guys went up in a helicopter, took pictures of that, took that to state legislatures and said, you know how you're killing Lake Erie? It's phosphorus. And at this point, it wasn't phosphorus from agriculture. It was phosphorus in our detergents. The detergent companies didn't like this at all, but they were called to account. And um, we ended up pulling phosphorus out of the, out of the detergent formulas. And so in 1972, uh, Dr. Seuss was writing about Lake Erie and the Lorax, and he was making fun of it. I don't remember ex his exact line, but by 1985, the lake had recovered so dramatically that some researchers at Ohio State wrote the good doctor, Theodore Geisel, and said, you should pull that from the Lorax. And he did. Now he should put it back. He's <laughs> dead. But, but Lake, lake Erie is a mess again, and it's phosphorus again. This time, it's not coming from a very specific uh, waste stream, it's coming off the landscape. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's not just coming from uh, agriculture. The, what are the other sources of uh, phosphorus in, in the lakes? Uh, yeah. Okay. So phosphorus can come from different sources. Um, urban runoff is a big one. Um, not as big as agriculture for the Lake Mendota watershed, um, but urban runoff. So the, the water that runs off of the streets, off of parking lots, it goes directly into storm sewers and then it goes right to the lake. So it's important for you all to know that that water that runs off is not treated. It goes directly to the lake. There's phosphorus that comes off, also oils and metals and all sorts of uh, uh, other pollutants. But again, we want to focus on phosphorus here. Another is um, sewage treatment plant effluents. Uh, that's not a huge source in the grand scheme of things, but um, you know, there's no sewage treatment plant effluent going into Lake Mend Mendota, but it is a source of phosphorus generally into waterways. And then there are other industrial sources as well, factories and so on. Those are generally minor. So the Clean Water Act from 1972 addressed these pipe sources quite nicely. So the amount of, of phosphorus coming from pipes has gone down a lot. And now what we're left with is agricultural and urban runoff from, from the landscape. So that, you know, the, the, the situation has changed, but it also does tell us that there have been problems in the past that have been largely solved, like the detergent problem, like the point source problem. And in the uh, example of the detergent problem, basically you had these three big detergent makers, right? Tide and two others. I don't do laundry much. So, you know, I usually just let let it sit until it can't sit anymore. And then there we go. I need Less to call a time out here. I got oh, a hand for you, Charlie. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Where did this come a from? See, Adam, I knew one of you guys were sneaking it in a here. Adam went back to the Center for Limnology and grabbed a beer for you. Oh, that's very there. kind. Just me. I'm going to come across like a degenerate up here, you know? Everything. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I, I will enjoy the clean water in this uh, hams here. You, you um, know where hams is from? Uh, hams? Yeah. Where, where is, is it from? from? The land of sky blue waters. What the you say? The land of sky blue waters. The land of sky blue. Oh, Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. Now you you're uh, you're from Minnesota, right? I'm from Wisconsin. Oh, you're from Wisconsin. Fox, Fox Valley. Okay, you're from the Fox Valley. Real good. Yeah. Now Minnesota, though. I mean, when we're talking about water, that's the land of ten thousand lakes. Yeah, uh, this is true. Um, they uh, they have ten thousand lakes in Minnesota. We have more lakes here in Wisconsin. Um, we can get a round you, of applause for that. If you go How to, many lakes do we have, Jake? If you go to Wikipedia or you ask the Wisconsin DNR, the official count is 15,074 lakes. Does so that, that count manure lagoons? Uh, it does not. It, do, it does not. Yeah. So um, I think we have a, I mean, but the point here is that we have an incredible number of lakes, an incredible diversity of lakes, and lakes are absolutely part of what make Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Um, they're part of our culture. They're part of our, our well-being, and, and they affect every, every one of us. So uh, we are here right now, each and every one of us, because of Lake Mendota. I mean, we wouldn't be here if there was no lake there. It'd be as boring as Ann Arbor, you know, if that lake wasn't here. 
Right, Ima- imagine Go this was a cornfield. Fish again. Uh, what's that? Imagine this was a cornfield. Oh, I mean, it, this would not. We would not be here right now. It'd be a different vibe. It would be a different vibe. But I, I guess my my point in bringing this up, and we were talking uh, earlier in the back room over there. But if you look at the Wisconsin license plate, you kind of have this image. And Dan, you brought it up. You want to go into that, or you want me to take your bet? Uh. Well, I'll just mention, yeah, I was thinking about it driving over here the other day. Um, the license plate, it's got a barn on it on one end and it's got a sailboat on the other. These are two things that define this great state and they should not be working at cross purposes. And too often right now, sometimes they are. And I think everybody values what's on the right side of the plate, the farms. Everybody eats. I had lunch today. I'll have dinner tonight. And, but everybody also needs water. And, uh, you know, there's no reason why we can't have both. And when I say needs water, this isn't an abstract threat. In uh, 2014, about a decade ago, uh, the city of Toledo got a, a plume of this toxic algae sucked into its drinking water system, and they lost their water for like four or five days, and they couldn't boil it. It wasn't like, oh, just boil your water, and we'll get this back online. If you boiled it, it would concentrate the toxins. So you had the National Guard bringing in pallets of baby formula and tankers of water and stores as close as like Ann Arbor, which is like an hour away, within the first three or four hours, we're out of bottled water. And so there they are in, in Toledo on the, on the banks of the world's grandest freshwater system. It holds 20% of the world's fresh surface water and you couldn't even drink it with treatment. And that's the sign that something's broken and we haven't fixed it yet. Now, Dan, uh, in doing, I've had you on the Cast before, and you've kind of made it clear that you don't really consider yourself an environmentalist. You consider yourself an environmental journalist where you are kind of laying out the issues that affect us. But as far as solutions go, that's not exactly um, what you're uh, trying to find here. You're more laying out. And by the way, you do a great job of making phosphorus interesting. I got to give you that, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that's the best compliment I've ever heard. Starts the book off with a police chase, you know? It <laughs> don't get any more fun than that. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. Oh, no. You, you. Well, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't try to be prescriptive in this book saying we need to do this, this, and that. But there are some obvious things that need to be addressed. And I think number one is what Jake was talking about. The Clean Water Act in 1972 went after factories and industries and left alone farming. At the time, farming was more. You know, it, it, it's exactly what Randy was talking about. It was it was cows eating grass. And, and this gets back to this phosphorus loop that we were talking about or the trickle of phosphorus into the world. If you think about a farm, you got pasture, a cow eats the grass, poops, that grows more grass, the cow eats it, poops, and it's a cycle. And it goes over and over and over. And it's what Mufasa was talking about in the circle of life. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I've watched The Lion it, King. Sorry, we, I digress. We turned it into a straight line, and that line runs into that water. I really screwed you up by throwing that <laughs> Mufasa reference in there. What's in the shadowy place, Dan? You must never go there. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I just riff on something Dan said? He yeah, please. Our license plate has the, the sailboat on one end, the barn on the other end. We all value the sailboat and the water that it's on. We all value the farming, the barns, etc., and yet, here's our crown jewel behind us, and it is slowly but surely we're titrating in, we're trickling in phosphorus in ways that are making it, you know, unusable eventually. And on the other side of the license plate are barns that we value and love. And when we think about Wisconsin, it's very iconic. And yet, Wisconsin is losing two farms a day for the last 30 years. And we're on a trajectory to have five farms by the year 2037, if we play out the last 30 years of farm loss. And in the meantime, we're making more and more milk. Our dairy science department is amazingly productive. They've done amazing work. And they've done what we've asked them to do, which is to figure out how to make more milk. But it's coming at a huge expense to the environment. And none of us can afford to say, I'm not an environmentalist. Sorry, Dan. We're all environmentalists. It's about our health and it's about our well-being. Well, maybe I put those words into his mouth. But yeah, you can, you can give that uh, a round of applause. It is about all our health. 
And I also, um, you know, in sort of preparing to do this, I was talking to a couple of buddies of mine who are farmers and, and they're kind of, they were, I was ta- bringing up this issue to them and, and they were kind of saying they are personally, and I can't speak for the entire industry, but they're saying that they do have regulations. There are a lot of steps in place to limit this. They are doing a better uh, job to do it. They're not uh, putting, uh, they're not doing it when the, the, the ground is frozen over. They're not doing it close to rain. Um, they're not putting it on hillsides, putting it far away from the water. And also, uh, the profitability for at least my buddies, they're not making a ton of money. And so I wonder, is is the system in play not set up for them to succeed all the time? Well, no, it's not. It's uh, it's set up for them to extract as much as they can out of the system and push that forward to the corporations, um, sadly. Uh, the, the things that they're doing, which are really laudable, cover crops, no-till, um, spreading manure only at certain times of the year, et cetera, those are all great things, important things, but they are not going to fix the problem that we have here. The problem is immense. So we've had a grad student, who uh, uh, Tracy Campbell, who works with Chris Kucharik in our department, uh, published a paper recently that showed in order for this lake to get clean, in order for it to meet EPA standards, we need half as many cows in the watershed half of the ag land in perennial grass, and it has to be like that for 50 years, and in the year 2070, we'll actually meet our goal. The problem is immense. It is not going to get fixed by a little bit of this here and a little bit of that there, and so that's why we're all about like trying to change the overall system and not just tweak it here and there to keep the same system in place. How would you recommend, uh, and I know you touched on this before, but how would you recommend changing the system and for farmers out there, how would that impact their bottom line? Farmers, <laughs> I love when I ask a question, you're like, I'm not answering that. He's the farm guy. I just, I know I'm waving my arms and pontificating here, but uh, it's an exciting topic for me. <laughs> um, well, we have to come together as a society and reward farmers for doing this. That's the first thing. Uh, we have to bring farmers and other folks in the community together, and this is what we're trying to do in this Grassland 2.0 project, and be intentional about what it is we want and need out of the land and what it is we want and need out of our communities, et cetera, what we want and need out of the water, and start to map and plan how we get there. And that's something that we're not doing right now. It's just sort of happening willy-nilly. The system just happens. And I think the system only changes when we come together as a community and embrace the idea of collective action. You know, this is how a lot of big things have happened in the world. Civil rights is an example of this. People come together in communities and and engage in collective action so that the powers actually have to listen. Okay, well, let's say this group of people here. Yeah, give give him a... I keep stepping on your applause, you know. Let's say this group of people here wanted to um, collectively come to a solution tomorrow and go you know, participate in the uh, democratic process of lobbying and all that sort of jazz. What would we even say we want, though? Can Um, I say something? Yeah, go on. I I was just going to say, if we're talking about this lake in particular, science can can guide that. Uh, And again, this isn't for changing the system per se. This is just changing this system right here, Lake Mendota. So studies done at the Center for Limnology revealed that if we can reduce the amount of phosphorus coming into the lake by about half, so right now it's 110,000 pounds of phosphorus washing in per year. If we could bring that down to about 50, we would have really darn good water quality. So those studies have been done. And then the question is, how do we reduce the, that, that, um, that phosphorus coming in? And that's where we get to agriculture, system changes, grasslands, and things like that. There have been a lot of practices like the ones that Randy mentioned, cover crops, um, riparian buffer strips, and so on, that have been implemented in farms that are upstream of Lake Mendota that drain in. Um, millions of dollars have been put, in, put into this. Farmers are participating in these programs. What we've seen is the total amount of phosphorus coming into the lake has actually increased over the time that these practices were being uh, implemented. And the reason why is climate change. We're getting more rain washing off the land and we're getting more large rain events and we've lost wetlands as well. 
So even though millions of dollars have been spent on this problem, we've actually seen increases in the amount of phosphorus coming in. So we have headwinds. Um, people are working really hard to address these issues. And yet it seems like we're on a treadmill and we're not, we're not getting anywhere. But stuff is being done. So we don't have to do anything then? We need to keep working and we need to be patient and recognize that it's, it's like raising children, right? You don't see the benefits. Uh, my kids are right over there. You don't see the benefits of it tomorrow or the next day. You just keep plugging away at it and you, the benefits are going to be long-term, hopefully. Is that a promise? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> my daughter's right over there. I would, I would have a uh, suggestion too. And that would be looking beyond the lake, this lake in particular, looking at this thing nationally, ethanol. 40% 40, 40 of the corn we grow in this country goes into our gas tanks. 40%. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of gas. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of food. You know, for, for the amount of acres that we're, we're growing uh, ethanol corn with, we could feed half the country with grains and vegetables. And so this is a kind of a no-win situation, except for the people who, who financially profit from it. And it seems like an intractable problem, but a sweep of a pen could, could fix this. And, you know, we're heading toward electricity anyway. I mean, electric vehicles. You look at the acreage being used in Iowa, there's been some studies where they'd be way better off planting solar panels you can actually grow stuff underneath the solar panels as well. You get a double bang for your buck. But, you know, this is, it seems like an intractable problem, but there are certain things that we could do now. And that would be take another look at ethanol and also take a look at this exemption in the Clean Water Act for, for agriculture and for what goes on the landscape. It needs to be measured and controlled until, until there are actual, you know, more than incentives, but, but consequences. I don't see things getting better very quickly. When it comes to ethanol, why is ethanol? Because, you know, you kind of, um, it's one of those weird issues that has both bipartisan support, but then also when you talk to people on both sides of the political aisle, you know, I, my, my uncle doesn't like putting in his gas tank, you know, and he's pretty far on the right. And then, you know, my hippie friends don't think it's, it's good for the environment. It's not solving the uh, climate issue at all. And so when you kind of have that di dichotomy a little bit, why, why is that the case, Dan? It's politics. And it's specifically, I mean, you could trace it back and make the argument that it's politics in Iowa, because that's where corn is king and ethanol is, is, is king as well. And uh, that's where politicians come out of the gate if they want to be president. They have to basically go to Iowa, specifically to the Iowa State Fair, where they stand on a stage smaller than this and tell the Iowa voters what they want to hear. And they all want to hear that they support ethanol. And this, you know, the, the Democrats have moved, pulled out of Iowa as their first caucus or first prime, first on the primary season. The Republicans are still there. And you're not going to win Iowa unless you do uh, show your faith to this whole institution of, of ethanol. I went over to Iowa in 2019 to the state fair and I tried to get Joe Biden's attention on the little soapbox. There were only about 50 of us there, but he wouldn't wouldn't call on me. I followed him into the bathroom afterwards. Wow. And, uh, That's a real journalist, folks, yeah. you know? <laughs> and then he... And now you're on a lot of lists. I got this on tape. Yeah. <laughs> my, my little run-in with him. Um, yeah, he, he, he comes out and uh, his hand's still wet and uh, he puts it on my shoulder. And I he, asked... No him, towels in there. He had to wipe it <laughs> off somehow. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I asked him, do you support do you support ethanol? And uh, he just looked me straight in the eye and said, yeah. And then the next day, Elizabeth Warren said the same thing. So it's not a Republican Democrat thing. It's just built into the system and we're all suffering because of it. Well, you pushed in your book, you pushed Joe Biden on it a little bit saying, I, I believe I, I remember this correctly, saying that the environmental benefits of it were, were not really there. What did he say to that? Well, he started talking about the holy grail of biofuels, and that's using the, the corn stock, not the kernels. They call it cellulosic, and, and they keep saying that it's about to happen, and it's not happening. And so that gives everybody cover to say, let us just put corn in our cars until we can figure out how to put corn stocks in our cars. Well, we don't need that. 
Yeah, R Randy, why is that the case that we're not that we're only using the kernel, not the whole stock? Because that could, and if we could use the whole stock, like if ethanol at its best, we we the technology progressed and we could use everything. Would it be a, a good thing, a net win for the environment? Absolutely, it would be a huge win for the environment. It not only can we do it now, we we have to do it. And why aren't we? We have the technology to do it. The reason we don't do it are these policies that subsidize the first generation ethanol, which is to say the, the ethanol that comes from the corn grain. And so if you can make ethanol out of a corn stalk, you can make it out of a switchgrass plant, you can make it out of a diverse prairie, you can make it out of any plant biomass. And we can do that now. It's cost effective now, especially if you take the subsidies that go to the first generation ethanol and put them at the second generation. But there are powers that be that don't want that to what happen, just like the... The last story I told. Well, what are the, the powers that be that are that are uh, coming between it? The corporations that make money from the current situation, where the first generation ethanol gets produced, and these ethanol plants that are built all across the country. And look again, it's this, this is rational actors. These are not nefarious people trying to undermine the planet. Uh, they're trying to do what they're supposed to do, which is make money for their shareholders. And which which corporations are these? I'm trying to get you to name names up here, Andy. You know, I'm really trying to throw you under the, the bus. I don't know who know? they are. I'm just an ecologist, Charlie. All right. You guys can Google it. And uh, it's definitely not Monsanto. Okay. Um, so I, but it's it, not just Monsanto for sure, but it, it's one of the, no, but, and again, to, you know, to your point, they are just playing within, it was like uh, Trump when he sat, sat up there on the debate stage and they were talking about how he didn't pay taxes. And he was like, why? Cause I'm smart. Well, that's the system we set up in play and he wasn't completely wrong. We don't have a system that rewards uh, the moral thing to do. We have a system that rewards uh, shareholders maximizing their uh, profits. That sort of goes back to the stock market. The stock market doesn't care about years from now. It cares about tomorrow. And um, this isn't an anti-capitalist thing by any stretch of the imagination. I just think capitalism would work better if we thought, I mean, the cost of water is, is insane. And we're going to be paying billions of dollars to clean up something that we only made millions of dollars from. I'm sorry, we're going to spend trillions of dollars, clean up something we paid billions of dollars for. It would have been cool if I didn't try to correct myself. I got a nice like applause there. You guys get what I'm saying though. At the end of the day, just thinking about these systems in whole. So let me ask you this. Now you have a lot of hard, uh, hardworking farmers out there in Iowa and uh, they've got corn because that's what they've had traditionally, historically. What would an ideal system look like uh, that, that they would be growing? I know you said grasslands, but kind of specific. And why is that so much better than corn? Well. They, we do agriculture in grasslands. You know, when we look around the world, there are really three main biomes, forest, grassland, and desert. And most of our agriculture is in grassland, in the grassland biome. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that where we do agriculture, we've torn up that grassland and cracked open all the energy that's stored in the soil there. And so what I mean by grassland 2.0 is that we have to have agriculture that actually starts to put that energy back into the soil which is all about taking a little bit less out of the system, harvesting a little bit less, putting back a little bit more so that the system actually accrues energy rather than loses energy. And that's putting grasslands back in place. It's restoring grasslands, perennial grasslands that used to be here. And I don't mean like it has to be wall-to-wall -wall tall grass prairie with butterflies and birds and bees. Oh yeah, they'll be there if we put the grassland back. Uh, it can be grazed pastures. It can be pastures for second generation ethanol. It can be all kinds of uses of that grass. And there's a lot of work that has to go into figuring out how to do that well. But we've got to restore that ecosystem. We've got to restore its function so that it holds on to nutrients, holds on to carbon, and takes care of us. So this all seems like a pretty logical thing to, to do. So um, is really... Is there a whole lot on the political side of this? And maybe, Dan, this might be something um, you can discuss. What, what, like from a political standpoint, if we explain this, or if any politician were sitting in this audience, I have a hard time thinking that they would see a different way. Um, what, what is sort of standing in the way? Is it just the way systems have been done? Yeah, I think we're, we're just kind of become slaves to the system. We don't think about it. We don't think about the fact that we've just basically built a whole 
uh, agriculture economy on one use 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 your fertilizer once and flush it away. It's got to be restored, and it, it's it's connecting dots. It's letting people realize that you know you bring your grandkid down here to take a dip off the dock and they can't go in. Well, how did that happen? And it comes back to the way we've engineered our, our food system. And you know, Wisconsin's got a great history of cutting edge, you know, breaking ground agriculture techniques. And I was just pulling my phone out here because I was thinking about just up the hill is uh, building F.H. King. And it's, is that the, the soil sciences building? And his name is Franklin, Franklin King, I believe. Anyway, F.H. Uh, was, uh, was a professor here. And he went over to Asia in 1908, 1909 to try to figure out how these guys were still alive. Because we would only, we'd only been you know, farming the Great Plains for a matter of decades and we were burning them up, even with, with the burgeoning nascent uh, chemical fertilizer industry. And he went over there and he wrote a book called Farmers of 40 Centuries, which is 4,000 years. And, and he was trying to get to, the, get to the bottom of how do these guys keep farming the same land year after year after year and getting the same kind of productivity. And the answer was thrift and, he, and, and recognizing the circular nature of, of life, of the Lion King, as you mentioned. It's the circle of life. Me, Sorry, I, I won't sing this, again. This yeah. just blew me away. Uh, he went to one farm and he saw this kid. This was in Korea, I think. Um, saw a kid following a cow around with a, with a dipper. And the cow was going around and around because it was powering a well that was drawing water to grow rice. The kid was following the cow because he was catching the poop coming out of his butt and putting it into some sort of a vessel. And uh, it was being returned to the land. And when he saw it, he was pissed. He, he wrote, uh, there came a flash of resentment that such a task for the lad, that there was such a task for the lad, for we were only beginning to realize what lengths the practice of economy may go, but there was nothing irksome uh, suggested in the boy's face. He performed the duty as a matter of course. And as we thought about it, there was no reason why it should be otherwise. In fact, the only right course was being taken. Conditions have been worse if collection wasn't being made. It made possible more rice. Character and substantial quantity, quality was building in the lad which meant thrift in the growing man and continued life for a nation. They, they recognize the phosphorus loop and, and we don't. And it's not, it's not really that hard to get once you start thinking about it. We can't just use it once and flush it in the water. That, uh, that's very well said. Also, that image of him, I'm like, what is he putting it in? You know, that was where my mind went, but I'm an idiot. Um, uh, Jake, um, I, I can't remember if you said this, but how many days out here, to Dan's point about not realizing this loop, how many days is it safe to swim in, in this way? Well, uh, I don't, it varies a lot from year to year, um, but there's a decent number of days every, I, I can't give you the exact number. Um, this year has been pretty good. We've had relatively clear water here. I've heard more complaints about it being bad over on uh, Lake Monona this year, particularly earlier in the year. We typically get big algal blooms on Lake Mendota in the mid to late summer. Weirdly, we had a big bloom on Mendota in May that caught everyone off guard. So um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to really put a number on it because from one year to the next, it can change a lot. I, I will say the reason why we've had pretty good water quality this year is that we've had a, something of a drought. There has not been a tremendous amount of rain, particularly in the early to midsummer, And so that sort of gave us a little break. And the algal blooms have been pretty, pretty, uh, pretty minor this year. Got it. Um, I do want to kind of open this up to any audience questions, uh, if they have any, if they have a couple. But before we get to that, I just want to see if you guys have any final thoughts or things that you thought I should have touched on that I didn't, or if I misstated something, you know, someone gave me a ham, so I can't be responsible for what I say. I don't think I've ever had a better interview in my life. Oh my gosh. Just oh, a real Midwest guy here, folks. 
He is full of phosphorus, but you know what? Love him for it. Uh, no, I, I would just say it's, it's good that we're here and we're focused on, on the lake behind us, but we need to recognize that this is a national and a global problem. I mean, it's, it's not just happening in Bain County. Even Great Grand Lake Superior is, for the first time in recorded history, getting, getting toxic algae blooms now. And we're on a system that is, is ultimately not sustainable. We're like a bunch of ants on a donut. We're going to eat the donut up if we're not, <laughs> we're not careful. Well, and in your book, you also mentioned that uh, it, there's al algae blooms in um, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, and they didn't think that this per specific yeah. type of algae could even go in salt water. But, you know, and then we were like, you know, hold my beer, <laughs> you know, let's, let's see. And that destroyed uh, their economy down there. The guy you mentioned in the book, it destroyed it worse than the BP oil spill and um, uh, Katrina. Uh, yeah. So Yeah, they lost their, they lost, the, all, Mississippi lost all of its coastal beaches for the whole summer in 2019, 40 miles worth of beaches. And I don't know if you've ever been in Mississippi in the summer, but you want to go in that, you want to go in that water. Yeah. And it just destroyed the, the tourism economy. So yeah, there's, this isn't just an environmental issue. It's a very much an economic issue. Dealing with all that swass without a notion, I tell you what. That's the quote of this, folks. You can put that on the top. Go ahead. I just wish you would have said, hold my beer one time during this whole thing. You have a hams and we all have this wonderful still water, which is, you know, it good. Is, but I'll share with you. <laughs> can you have a swig? I just want to say that I, I have the, the privilege of standing up in front of several hundred undergraduate students here at UW Madison in the fall in uh, two classes that I teach. And um, I'll just say that every year uh, I see eyes open and pupils dilate and jaws drop when they start to hear about a type of agriculture that is actually part of the solution, not only to our water problem, but to our climate problem, to our biodiversity problem, to our communities problem. And I think young people are the key to this. You know, we keep thrashing around here looking for solutions. It's not gray beards like me. Uh, I'm willing to come up here and stamp my foot and wave my arms, but the young people are going to stand up and they are standing up and demand that the system changes and that's got to keep happening. We got to find a way to support them. And I, I think this has been a, a tremendously uh, fun interview. Um, I, like Dan, I think this is one of the most uh, most fun interviews I've, I've had. I do want to uh, make make a shout out to um, you know UW Madison and the Wisconsin idea. I I have been really impressed with how UW Madison has pushed to bring the work that we do out into the world across the states, um, across the nation, and beyond. And um, that has been re really a fun thing to be a part of. I mean. Um, Lake Mendota has been studied by limnologists at UW-Madison since the uh, 1880s. And so this is basically where the field of limnology uh, began. Um, these are some of the most well-studied lakes in the world. And so a lot of the things that we know about phosphorus and lakes um, comes from studies that have happened here over the last 100 years or so. So uh, it's been really fun to be part of UW-Madison and, and in so many areas. Uh, this is the case. I mean, and probably in your field, it's 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 the same. So uh, you're saying it's yeah. sort of like maybe we're not going to be part of UW Madison after this. Well, I, I think we should say. I think we should say. Um, I want to say one other thing. We've ha we've heard references to Dan's book. Dan's book. Dan's book. This is his book, and it's about as green as an algal bloom. So if you saw that in a bookstore from maybe a hundred meters away, you'd probably recognize it. It's called The Devil's Elements. Um, Dan isn't going to put a plug in for it, but I'm happy to do it. It's a fantastic book. I've read it twice. And uh, there is so much interesting stuff about phosphorus that you never knew, but you'll, you'll learn if you read the book. And yeah, give a big round of applause for that book. I've read it too. And by read it, I don't mean I listened to it on Audible. So. Excuse the interruption, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to let you know that bonfire season is back. Woo. And I, th Colleen is a big fan of bonfire yeah. season. Hoodie in the bonfire. Mm -hmm. And while you're chasing that smoke or while that smoke is chasing you <laughs> around the bonfire, make sure you're enjoying a jolly good soda to keep your palate quenched. Jolly <laughs> good soda, ladies and gentlemen. The perfect soda for any fall campfire. 
And also, folks, football season is here and Fleet Farm has everything you need to get game day ready. Shop their huge selection of snacks for your tailgate and pick up trail mix, nuts, chocolate and more because everyone will be coming back for seconds. Make sure you're in the best gear for game day comfort and everyone in the family and make your tailgate the best in the lot with portable grills and every grilling accessory you could ever want. Get in there to Fleet Farm. Grab their uh, grab their tongs, start clicking them, start feeling the grills, and ladies and gentlemen, walk out there with something special for your tailgate. Fleet Farm, ladies and gents, we love it. And also, folks, head on over to CripesCast.com, our new game. That's right. If you want to play a, a, a game with your friends and family, we've got a card sale. My buddy and I uh, made this game. Uh, it, it's all about um, bargaining when you go to a yard sale. It's called Card Sale. I made it with Dane Schaefer. It's a fun game, fun mm-hmm. for the whole family. Check it out. Enjoy. Also, we got the Midwest Survival Guide up there. Uh, I got a new album coming out in about a month. That's a deep tease. Not there yet. We got tickets to our shows coming up. And of course, if you want to see behind the scenes stuff, we got patreon.com slash Charlie Barron's. And also, sweatshirt and koozie for bonfire season. Think about that. Cripescast.com. Check it out, folks. And now, back to the union. Before we get to questions, and thank you so much. I see we got a question here. I just want to give a shout out to Clean uh, Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsinites understand how important it is to protect our state's environment. 50 years, Clean Wisconsin. There are 20,000 supporters have been leading the charge to defend Wisconsin's clean air clean water, and everything else that makes Wisconsin great. You can get involved by going to cleanwisconsin.org. Uh, keep up with the uh, environmental news and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, if you're looking to help after this, you don't know where to start. Clean Wisconsin's a good spot to start. So uh, give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and with that, sir, you have a question. I was wondering if there's a place on the terrace that we could buy the book today. Oh, that is a good question. I believe there is somewhere. <laughs> Spoken like a true author, you know? <laughs> Drives publishers nuts. Tell them where to buy it. I'm telling you five times, this is where they buy it. Yeah, it's uh, somewhere here, I'm pretty sure. Well done. I got a copy right here, but... Yeah, and I think probably the UW Bookstore has some copies as well. I, I, I Maybe. I'm going to give that a definite maybe, folks. Yeah, there, there are boxes here somewhere. Excellent. There are boxes here, so you can find them. Oh, that way. Boxes that way. Okay. Real good. All right. Cool. Nice uh, mustache, you. sir. Thank you. I, I it all summer. Yeah. Uh, Dan loved the book. Charlie loved the content. Um, but I have a question about the system and how economics can really work into this. Um, if phosphorus is really just kind of being used and disposed of, do you think like a pricing scheme could really restrict that as in like a high tax or something of that? Do you think the system might respond and kind of encourage that circular system rather than our current like linear one yeah but i mean nobody likes regulations you know it's easier to throw money at a problem than to make people start behaving differently but there are so many economies to be had in in the system that we have right now it's been estimated like 20 percent. i was saying earlier we get this phosphorus from these rocks these special rocks and in the united states most of them are in florida it's been estimated that 20% of the phosphorus in those rocks actually makes it into food that's on our on our plate. Most of it is just wasted in processing and in transport and in poor applications on fields. So there, there's a lot that could be that could be done there. And also, as far as chemical fertilizer, we need to start recognizing this manure as an asset as well. In this book, I talk about kind of the history of fertilizer, and at the beginning. People were throwing on the land anything they could think of to make things grow. And if it made them grow, they'd throw more of it to the point that they figured out bones somehow made turnips grow really well in England. And so the English went over to Waterloo five years after the battle where 40,000 people died and they mined the battlefield for the bones. They built special mills to crush the bones. They're literally eating their young in the form of bread and animal products. Real uplifting stuff here, Dan, well, but, you know. But we ran out. So so here's my point. We ran out of that. And then we found it in these islands covered in bird poop. The bird poop was lousy with phosphorus. Mine those to the ground. Now we're going through these rock deposits. And, and we're going to, the, the, the last great deposits left on earth right now are in Morocco and Western Sahara. 70 to 80% of the phosphorus left on the planet are phosphorus reserves, proven reserves 
is in that area that may not or may not may or may not share our interest in having food on the table every night. So we regulation is is maybe going to happen after we hit a crisis and uh, that'll be too bad, but it won't be the first time. Well, that's an interesting point, too, because a big reason, you know, ethanol is uh, one of those things that was pushed and currently is pushed is energy independence. But if energy independence comes at the cost of food insecurity, then maybe we have a bigger problem on our hands. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Can, go I, for can it. I just say something about that? I, I, I like the notion and, and people are working on this very thing. Um, but I think it's critical that we understand that the reason that the phosphorus is running off and running into the lakes is because there's a mass imbalance. We're bringing more into the watershed than the land can actually hold on to. And, you know, you can call it regulation if you want. There was a guy here named Leopold in, in the 30s and, and, and early 40s who called it a land ethic, where we actually just target the number of animals to what the land can support. And, and right now our farming system is based on, I want to have as many as I can and that requires me to import nutrients from outside of the watershed, which eventually are going to run off. Yeah, go or go ahead. No mustache for you, but still looking good. So. This is like a week of no shaving. So, oh, nice. <laughs> <Pretty sad. laughs> good for you. You know, less razor. That's right. Uh, thanks for the great conversation. A lot of a uh, lot of stuff covered, and I was just curious. You had briefly mentioned switchgrass. Um, I'm not really a farmer or anything, so I was curious if that could be grazed to support two simultaneous income streams for the farmer. And if so, what would that mean in terms of uh, the thin profit margins that you were talking about, Charlie? Would that be a viable way to sort of bridge the divide um, with groups of people that traditionally are opposed to restrictions against the current ethanol system, for example? Yeah, a lot of people graze switchgrass, especially west of here on the Great Plains. It's a native grass to the Great Plains. It's a native grass to North America. And so the problem with grazing it and making it into ethanol is if you graze it, then it's not there anymore to turn into ethanol. So there's got to be some sort of a, a management scheme there where you set aside some for ethanol and set aside some for grazing. But these are things that people are working on, the agronomics of all that, what pencils out, what doesn't. Yeah. And, and the great thing about switchgrass is it's a perennial grass. It puts a lot of roots down deep and hopefully builds carbon in the soil. And just to follow up on that, again, with the switchgrass and, and the ethanol, I just want to sort of uh, reiterate, like if, if they that system of taking the entire corn stalk, that may be in conjunction with the native grasses. Is, is that kind of one thing you're recommending there? No. No, taking good. Entire, I'm glad I clarified. Taking that. the entire corn stalk is exactly what we need to stop doing. Got it. Because we're mining the carbon away from the system that otherwise needs to go back into the system to replenish the soil. Okay, understood. Cool. Real good. Any uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm good. All good. I How like that doing? shirt. Yeah. Did you get that Coles? I think so. Nice. It might be Land's End. Oh, okay. Either way, it looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You anyway. Look, you look good, too. Well, now you're just saying that. Okay. Oh, really? Really? Okay. We could be up here all night. I like your socks, too. Thanks. Uh, what's your question? My question is uh, regarding the recent changes in regulations protecting our wetlands and uh, how that's going to affect what we're all trying to do here. I've, I've been living abroad for a year, so I don't know what these changes were. Well, yeah, you mean the, the diminishing definition of what is a wetland and what's protected by the Supreme Court? That's just not good. I mean, the water is not heading in the right direction right now. And I don't want to comment on it too much, but um, yeah, we, we, need, we need more protections for, uh, for our water bodies rather than less. And anybody who's been to a beach and couldn't take their kid into the water knows that on some level, and they should probably know it on a level that may activate or prompt them to have some desire to express themselves to their representatives. The problem is, is people are just taking this too much. They just, they, there's this idea of the shifting baseline where people just get used to things going to crap. And we were, we were prepping for this just down the shoreline here, and we were looking at all these kids on the dock uh, just whatever direction that is from here. And they're all on the dock. None were in the water. And it was kind of tragic to look at it. Yeah, just looking down the beach and seeing all these guys on the dock, guys and girls on the dock, not in the water. And it's like, that's, that's tragic. 
but we did see a number of them jumped in at the last minute. And I think it's it's just really important that people don't don't just take this. They don't go to the beach and turn around and think, oh, well, that's the way it is. It doesn't have to be that way. And then and that, that Supreme Court ruling is not going in the right direction. Hey, Charlie and Dan and crew. We have a couple chat, a couple questions from the YouTube chat. First one's from Richard. If it will be decades before we may see phosphorus reductions from the watershed, should be should we be looking at treating inflows with alum, like many other computers have been successfully doing? I, so I think I think the question is about al alum treatments. Um, yes. So alum is a chemical that that binds phosphorus, and so there are examples around the world where um, alum was added to waters, polluted waters that were coming in, sort of sucks up the phosphorus and holds it. Uh, you know, th that's a technical solution that may or may not be, you know, financially viable here. Um, my view for addressing issues like this is that we need to have all of the tools on the table and ideally use all of them simultaneously because just doing one thing at a time is uh, is generally not going to solve the problem. We need to be taking uh, every every tool we have and throwing it at, at, at the problem. Given that we've been doing a lot already for the last 20 years and we've seen very uh, slow progress. So I would say... Let's see if it. Let's see if it'll, it'll work. There has been conversation about using alum, and I think there's been some local scale alum treatments here already. And I'll just pile on to what Jake is saying about doing one thing at a time. We need to. We need holistic solutions. We need to look across all of our problems, whether it's phosphorus, nitrogen, biodiversity, profitability of farms, community vitality, and look for solutions that solve all of those parts of the equation simultaneously. And you know, just picking something like alum and saying that's the answer, we're just going to end up with other problems and other dimensions that we that we don't address. All right, we have one other question from the chat from Geneva. What's an emerging What's an emerging agricultural practice, piece of technology, or policy that you're particularly excited to see put into practice? Well, Randy and I would probably maybe disagree a little bit, but I'm encouraged by the idea of basically starting to plumb the big farms. And by that, I mean sending the uh, liquefied manure in pipes to treatment plants. One cow produces about 18 times the waste that a human being does. And how many, how many cows are in the watershed here? Uh, 70,000. What's 70,000 times 18? You. <laughs> it's a lot. I mean, it, it's a giant city's worth, worth of worth of toxic goop that we should be harvesting rather than disposing of. And uh, and with the digester, I, I went over to Crave Brothers. They do cheese, and they have that methane digester there, and um, it, it powers the entire city. Um, uh, you know, it's not a huge city over there. I believe this is in Waterloo. I might be mistaken on that city, but. Um, they were pretty excited about it, and I, I got excited about that as well. Now, Randy, we were talking about that. You, you see some limitations to the methane digester. Is that the case or no? Well, they seem to they seem to work when they work, but when they don't work, it creates a big mess, and uh, so that's a, a particular problem. And and I'll just double down on my uh, you know when we find these engineering solutions that seem to take care of one problem that leaves us with the other problems that are still part of the system. And so I just, again, think we need more holistic approaches. And you know that's why I'm so bullish on restoring the original grassland biome. That's why you're the grass man, okay, grass man. all right. Not for the reason you had hoped. Ah, uh, had to ask, you know. Oh yes, another question, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks guys, this has been really interesting. Um, so a lot of the solutions are either explicitly or implicitly dependent on public policy to implement. And we know that many of our institutions are broken and, and we don't have a lot of good evidence of effective public policy in the moment. Um, that's just sort of the preface. It, if, if public policy is, is not sort of immediately available to solve these problems, do you have any anecdotes or ideas on how private initiative, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, kind of individuals acting in some creative way could contribute to solutions. And, you know, I'm an economist. I'm kind of interested in, well, what kind of incentives are there for people to make money off of fixing this problem? And, and you know, have you guys thought about that or have anecdotes? One thing that jumps out to me is 
going back to these digesters. It was reported in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, manure digesters. Uh, in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, I think it was last year, earlier this year, um, that they're producing now, like there was a farm up in northeastern Wisconsin, I think it was in Brown County, producing, uh, it's a 3,500 head uh, dairy operation. And uh, because they're now stripping the methane out of it, they're making $350,000 a year off, off of that waste. And that's, as one guy said in the story, he's like, we're getting close to the, the poop being worth more than the manure. And is that a long-term solution? No, but it's, it's, it's a point where you got to take notice and think about what are, we, what are we making and how and what are the consequences. There's also built into that a danger that there's a perverse incentive to just start producing more manure because you can make more methane out of it. And then what do you do with the milk? I mean, we just last month in, uh, in Milwaukee, they were dumping milk through the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District because uh, there was a glut. It happened during COVID and that was understandable because, you know, demand was down. But this was like, this was in July. I mean, they were, they were running milk through, through the poop factory. So I'll just say, Dan, thanks for the question. Um, you know, we keep, I've talked a lot about the system, the system, this sort of nebulous thing that nobody feels like they have any agency to change. And then there are all these individuals, these individual farmers, individuals in the community, uh, but there are these organizations that work in that sort of in-between space. And that's that collective action thing that I think is so critical. And so in our Grassland 2.0 project, as one example, we have these things called learning hubs where we come together and we work hard to bring people to the table to intentionally map out what would the market look like if it was beneficent? What would the policies look like? And how can we get some political will to shake those policies and markets free? And let's see what we can do as a collective group. I don't have any easy answer, but to me, that's the best way forward. Oh, yeah, one over here. Yes. Hi, um, Randy Jackson. I'm Frankie Anderson. I don't know if you know me or remember me. And I met you, Charlie, at the Vintage. I actually, that guy could pretty much ask the same question, but I just wanted to say thank you so much. He really did. I was going to ask, like, give us something inspiring to end in, like what we can do as people, as humans, you know, to collectively change the society that we live in so that we aren't endangering, you know, our most precious resources. So hi, everyone. Thank you. And can you leave us with something? Something hopeful or a stand-up bit? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I, it was nice seeing you at the vintage. I do remember that, despite what you probably uh, think. I don't remember it, but uh, I do recall. Yeah, no, it's nice. Uh, no, well, it, well, I think, I mean, look at this. Look around. You have all these people here that are interested in it. You know, coming up to this thing, Dan was like, yeah, we'll do it on the terrace. I was like, okay, outdoor, uh, outdoor podcast, um, you know, about um, phosphorus at the terrace. Um, yeah, no, that's going to go great, Dan. That's going to go great. And then we got here and there was no beer. And I was like, okay, no, it's going to go awesome. But it was, I mean, you guys were all sitting here listening intently. I think you have this many people interested in, in this issue. I mean, to me, that's really inspiring. Um, yeah. Give yourselves a big round of applause. At the beginning, you mentioned that swimming in waters with high phosphorus levels and harmful algal blooms could be pretty dangerous. I was wondering if we should be concerned about eating fish from waters with high levels of phosphorus and harmful algal blooms. Oh, that's a real good question. I'm glad you yeah. asked that. I've, Friday night fish fries. I know. I've existed on a diet of walleye and perch for a long time now. Yeah. Am I yeah. going to die? I, I, I think you're okay, right? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the harmful algal blooms like cyanobacteria can be toxic to fish. There are some examples of where fish can, can take them up into their bodies as well. The primary concern in a lake like Mendota and many other lakes is, is truly the direct exposure from swimming in the water and then drinking that water. Um, so you don't, if you swim in the water, you don't want to drink the water. Most people don't drink the water when they swim, but little children do and pets do. So that's why you'll hear about pets dying when they swim uh, more so. No, not so much. No. And uh, so, so I think, you know, uh, the other thing is the aerosolization of the, um, of the uh, cyanobacteria. So the, to of the toxins. So you can actually inhale the toxins if you're near the lake. 
and that can cause respiratory problems and so on. Um, I, I wouldn't worry so much about uh, about uh, eating fish and cyanobacteria. I have seen cases even here in Lake Mendota of fish kills that were caused by harmful algal blooms. You don't want to eat the fish that died in the fish kill. You don't want to eat fish that look like they're healing over because they're, they're dying. But I think overall, you're, pro you're probably all right. And I wouldn't worry about Charlie. Okay, real good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Eat your walleyes, folks. They're still good for you. Um, I was wondering about organic farming. And if that is, I know, does, is that relevant to this discussion? Is it a better alternative? Is it a possible part of the solution to increase that? and promote that, or is that not really a solution to the phosphorus problem? Well, organic farming can be part of the solution in as much as it requires livestock, especially cows that are being reared, to graze on grassland. And so anytime you have more grassland on the landscape, it's holding on to soil, holding on to phosphorus, holding on to other nutrients. So in that regard, yes, it can be part of the solution. We are concerned about parts of organic farming, in particular with weed management, that impart a lot of soil disturbance over and over and over to manage the weeds. And this is just a, a problem that we have in our organic systems. People are coming up with creative solutions to deal with it, but it is something that we have to be mindful of is that we can lose a lot of soil with organic farming. Cover crops certainly help, no-till and that sort of thing certainly helps. So I think organic is part of the solution. It's part of the way forward. If nothing else, it helps us change our mentality and our narrative about what it is we expect out of the land and, and, and putting back into the land as much as we take. All right. Th thank you, everybody, for coming out. Please give Dan and Randy and Jake a big round of applause. Buy Dan's book, The Devil's Element, somewhere over there. And everybody, watch out for deer. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Folks, that was it for this week's episode of the Cast. I do want to thank C. Grant for uh, putting on this show. I want to thank Dan Egan for uh, uh, coming out. And uh, really, uh, this all was his idea. Mm -hmm. Huge thanks to Jake Van Der Zanden uh, and UW Center for Luminology. Also, thanks to Randy Jackson. Make sure you check out Grassland 2.0. And uh, Clean Wisconsin, if you're looking to get involved, Clean Wisconsin um, is a great place to start. With that, everybody, uh, you know, think about the ideas, whatever, that we, we brought up today. Maybe it sparks an idea in some of you. You know, I, th I think there's, if there's one thing that we've learned um, from our political system is that often it doesn't necessarily work, but uh, the real things that work come from all of us. You know, eventually we need the political system, but sometimes it's frustrating, you know, looking at um, sort of what's in place and why it's in place and the lobbying and all this, that, and the other thing for, for special interests that are not the rest of our interests. Mm -hmm. So that's frustrating. So, and I also want to end this podcast by just giving a huge thanks to all of our farmers working your asses off uh, again, buddies of mine, good buddies, family are farmers and they care a lot about the land. They care a lot about what they're doing and they are, you know, kind of operating in the system that we have all put in place and we all have demand for their products. And so this is not a them versus us thing. This is, we, uh, we are all in this together kind of a deal. So I just want to thank the farmers for working very hard out there. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, this inspires some ideas. So thank you all for listening. Everybody keep her moving and do watch out for deer out there. All right. So roll out the barrel and get the band brewing. Life's got you down. Just keep her moving. It's on Wisconsin. The Badgers say it's the old Wisconsin Jubilee. You know, sometimes when you're ice fishing, you put your foot into walleye hole and go ass over tea kettle and you think you're done. No, you gotta keep her moving. <laughs>